Alright, here we go. Take one. <laughs> Everybody has a story. And this podcast is always seeking out new insights, new information, new perspectives, and new opinions. Everybody has a story. My life is an open book, and gladly I will share with the world my pain, my suffering, and anything that I feel someone can relate to or I can help someone. You know, a lot of years ago during my drug abusing days, I was lost. You know, despite what a lot of people argue about drug abusers, that they just want to get high, they want to live this irresponsible life that will kill them any day. And I want to let you know, you're wrong. I want it out. I wanted to be free from that nightmare. I hated myself. I hated my life. And I wasn't able to see any future. You know, some of us start young in life, while others wait some years to begin. But either way, it doesn't look good for anything or anybody. I want everybody to stay tuned for my guest today. He's the author of The Naked Guy in the Addict and has a powerful story of hope. I'll be right back. Hey, my name is Eric McCoy, and welcome back to the podcast that promotes that one thing that we're all searching for, highness. High wall clean is just that. Keep getting high, but again, drugs really just eventually destroy that ability, and eventually it stops working. And I can probably say all the guests that I've had on, the, on my show and all the ones that I will have on my show will attest to this, otherwise they wouldn't be clean today. You know, drug abuse has a lot of faces, and it can be very hard to pick them out until a lot of times it's too late. You know, having worked with a lot of people over the years, you come across some who didn't embrace this demon or even to go darker, sell their soul until later in life. You know, for those who can say that they started at a young age, as I did, you know, I wasn't usually, it wasn't usually the same reason that we started as those that began a lot of times later in life. You know, I started to self-medicate, you know, some depression when I was a kid. I felt a pleasure that I never even thought existed. It gave me confidence. Um, I was more outgoing and it masked all my fears and all my feelings that I wasn't comfortable with. Now, for a lot of those that start later in life, it's usually a major event that triggered that desire to try it. And this way they could numb themselves or they could avoid the pain. You know, the similarities that we all had was that it worked, or at least it seemed to work in achieving what we thought we needed. Now, solving something in the world of drugs is not the way most people think of a solution, but it's more of pushing it far enough away to forget about it or to not feel anything about it. Now, for my listeners who haven't experienced the horrors of chemical dependency, you know, everybody knows that I am fighting against the stigma and I'm working to get people to understand the grips that it takes on you. You know, as words can hardly describe the power and I have a guest today who fits the face of a powerful meth addiction that began later in life. And it was triggered by a major event that happened to him. 
you know, methamphetamine <clears throat> for those who haven't used it creates a very powerful illusion that life is perfect. The drug induced pleasure is so powerful that you can't even imagine that there's a problem until it's too late. How can you argue that energy, focus, pleasure, and confidence are bad? You know, feelings go away and emotional pain no longer seems to matter. As you continue using the drug, tolerance builds, requiring more of the drug until you've walked out of what we call homeostasis into this new norm that's called allostasis. And allostasis requires the drug to keep moving. And without it, you're completely incapable of functioning at all. Did I know that this was going to happen when I started? No. I actually felt that the solution that it was given me was going to last forever. Did my education in school teach me this? No. You know, in school, I was taught, just say no. What was I saying no to, right? Energy, focus, pleasure, confidence. You know, we continue, I believe, to fail our people. You know, fear tactics without real education tells us nothing. Now, my guest today is Jason Cup, who is the author of a new book, and it's called The Naked Guy in the Addict. Going to be interested in finding out why he titled it that. And it's an autobiographical account of his life as a recovering crystal meth abuser. He's also that someone who did not experiment with drugs until later in life. Jason, I want to thank you for being here today and joining me. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you that question. I was curious on that. The Naked Guy in the Addict. Where did that title come from? So uh, it was kind of a cross between a metaphorical title and a literal title. Um, I did have a literal time where uh, I was in an apartment complex uh, using with a group of people and I separated from the group and we ended up, uh, I, I ended up looking for what this drug inevitably brings me to because I was what you'd call a sex tweaker, which means that when I got high, I wanted lots of sex and just you know uncontrollable amounts of it. Uh, along with the drug itself. And I uh, kind of got into this situation where I was in a psychosis somewhat, uh, where I was looking for sex in all the wrong places, places where people would have no business even going into. Mm. And uh, somehow I found my way into this crawl space that brought me into this large uh, attic space of an apartment. And it was very vast, but it had a lot of different uh, turns and twists that once you're high and when you're in the pitch black dark and your battery goes out on your phone, you have no idea where you are. And I spent about 11 hours in that attic uh, in the middle of the summer, late afternoon. Uh, I had stripped away all my clothes. I, my phone had uh, died and I had lost it somewhere in there. And uh, I literally became the naked guy in the attic. Uh, the, the name of it came about because uh, I was at a 12-step meeting for CMA, Crystal Meth Anonymous, and uh, one of the gentlemen that shared up at the podium, he had mentioned that there was somebody that had gotten into a fight with their dog in his apartment complex. And we were just getting into conversation, and he started to share about where he lived, and it sounded very familiar. And I said, you know, I think I've been in your building. And I started to recant the story about my experience in there, and he said, oh my God, you're that naked guy, the crazy <laughs> naked guy in the attic. Everybody knows about you here. You're infamous. And uh, you know, the that day when I was in there, the police ended up getting called. They were going to drill a hole in the apartment roof just to be able to get me out. Fire department came. It was, and I was just literally ascending the outside of the building uh, with a cable cord to get to the the top and escape from the attic space, completely naked. And, uh, you know, again, this is near downtown LA. You know, the things that we do with this drug, uh, <laughs> that was just one example of the many times that um, I made some not so great choices in my using. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the book. 
Yeah, that's one thing meth does. Meth does, um, you know, induce a lot of sexual drives. You know, you end up having a lot of sex with a lot of people, um, which obviously also adds upon the risks that, you know, you can get of HIV and other obviously sexually transmitted diseases because we're not usually that safe either. Correct. And, and uh, you know, one of the activities that I like to to engage in when I was actively using was hosting these large kind of sex groups where, um, you know, sex without protection was very commonplace. In mm -hmm. fact, it would be considered an insult if somebody was to ask somebody if they had protection. And, um, you know, not surprisingly, while I was out there using, I did, uh, you know, I contracted HIV, I contracted Hep C and many other STDs along the way. I'm very grateful and fortunate that, you know, my HIV is manageable with meds today and my hep C has since been treated and I don't have any other STDs, but that's only because I'm sober and did what I needed to do to take care of myself. But when I was out there, I didn't care, you know, when I was getting to the point where, you know, I tested positive, it was just another reason for me to go out and use because I could say, you know, oh, woe is me. Here's another reason that you know, uh, the world has wronged me. So let me go out and get high so I can numb myself, you know? So just another example. So you were, uh, IV, IV drug user. Correct. Yeah. I, I used in all different ways, uh, for my first couple of years, uh, smoking was the primary means, um, you know, but I also parachuted it, which was, you know, ingesting, I also did it, um, you know, through what's called booty bumping, which is through the ass. And uh, I also distorted it. Um, but the way that really fast tracked my using and really brought me to uh, some pretty low bottoms in my using was uh, IV injection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely by far the most dangerous route. It bypasses all our body's protective mechanisms that it has. Um, so you so you did so you caught the whole package then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I didn't want to miss any opportunity. And I am very much the, the type of personality that, you know, once I like to do something, I like to do it to the fullest extent to the extremes. <laughs> so I wanted to go to now you started, uh, obviously, later in life, which, you know, for a lot of people, that's unique, because not everybody falls in that. I mean, a lot of the people that really get heavy new drugs do start young. Um, but you, on the other hand, were somebody that were was, uh, you know, obviously went to college, highly educated, you were an executive um, in a company. And, mm -hmm. um, and then at some point in time in your 30s, is that correct? Yeah, um, I, you know, growing up, I was raised in a, a family where alcoholism was, uh, you know, my, my mom's parents both uh, had alcoholism that they both suffered from and died at a relatively early age. Um, so, you know, we were aware of that. And as a result, there really wasn't a lot of drugs. Uh, alcohol was, you know, commonplace in the house, but, you know, not so much the drugs. And growing up, I, I very much was focused on my academics. I got into a relationship at a relatively young age, and we were together for 14 plus years. And we really, for the most part, avoided any drugs. Towards the latter stages of our relationship, we started to experiment with cocaine, with ecstasy, uh, MDMA, you know, different things like that, that were more kind of club, you know, like right. the quote unquote light fair drugs, I like to call them. Um, and it really wasn't until the uh, traumatic end of my relationship that, um, that, you know, for many people, they wouldn't necessarily, you know, say that the end of a relationship is a trauma. But to me, a trauma is just something that, you know, kind of has that mental switch in your head that you start acting in very different ways than you would otherwise. And your your whole world kind of shakes. And for me, that really was what happened. You know, I had a very set expectation of where I thought my life was going. I thought the relationship I was in was going to be one that I would be until the end of my days. I had a, a very you know successful career path that was going. And then once that relationship uh, ended, it just it, it sent my it sent my world in kind of a different direction. And uh, you know, I was going out and just getting plastered drunk uh, at the bars initially, just to kind of like numb and escape from the pain that I was in from the relationship. And through happenstance, I was at a, a bar and I got hit up by a couple of people online. They invited me over to their place. I was drunk. 
Uh, they had something there that I was not as familiar with, and they called it Tina, uh, which I was not familiar with that term initially. Uh, eventually, I came to understand that it was crystal meth that they were using. Um, they offered it to me, and I remember very clearly having this moment where I thought, this is not a good idea. I should say no to this. I should probably leave. But I had been this person that was very responsible in my life throughout my relationship, throughout my family, uh, had always kind of quote unquote done the right thing. And uh, I was drunk, I was horny, and I was in a lot of emotional pain. And I just wanted to forget for a while. And so I said, fuck it. And I said yes in a moment where I normally would have said no, thinking that it would be a seemingly innocent decision. I'd have a little bit of fun for the night and move about my life. Uh, and little did I know how that one decision that night would end up changing the course of my life forever. So you didn't literally walk into it with, I'm just going to fuck up my life today. <laughs> right? Not, not in the slightest, not in the slightest. <laughs> it, it was literally a moment of, well, I mean, there wasn't a lot of thought that went into it at all, for sure. It, it was, let me just have some fun, like we typically would, uh, you know, thinking that way I would get a nice little hookup and then I would go home. I could say I checked that box of trying this drug that I never didn't think I would ever try before. And uh, I didn't think I would really even start using it on a regular basis. Uh, that kind of came a little bit later after that first time. Hmm. Now, you identify obviously as gay. Is that correct? I do. And you know, I've worked in, I've been in the industry, work, you know, substance abuse field for many, many, many years. And one of the common themes that I do see a lot of is the, um, and, and very specifically with methamphetamine, is a huge methamphetamine problem in the gay community. Mm -hmm. How prevalent is that as far as what you see? Is that? Uh, very prevalent. When I first was exposed to crystal meth. It was uh, when I was still in my relationship. Uh, we we had a closed relationship initially, and over a couple of years into it, we started to experiment a little bit by uh, you know having just kind of random people on occasion uh, come over for uh, you know a little bit of sex and you know keeping it fun in between the two of us for the most part. When we would go online uh, to find individuals. Uh, on occasion, we would have people ask us if we PNP, party and play, um, or if we party with a capital T. You know, these were all code words for, you know, do you use crystal meth? And, you know, initially I was very naive and thought, you know, yeah, I celebrate, I party, you know, and it, it, eventually I, I aligned to, to what it meant. But it was very taboo at that time. Uh, you know, it was something that uh, was familiar in the gay scene. Certainly, uh, there was plenty of people that used it, but it was very much kind of underground. Fast forward several years, and um, when I started using, I would say that it was still underground, but it was coming more common um, to the point where if you asked someone or if I asked someone online if they partied, I would get a favorable or not favorable response, uh, but those that used to shun you wouldn't anymore because it just became something that you would almost expect to see when you would go online. Crystal meth is something that's definitely, uh, you know, it, it's a problem. And I, I've seen it not just in Los Angeles. I lived in New York for a brief time and I was exposed to it there. Um, I did a lot of uh, travel abroad and in most of the major cities I was in, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was, you could pretty much always find it if you were looking for it. But I wanted to ask you, though, with now, obviously, you did not have a drug problem when you were younger. That wasn't really an issue that you had. Um, now, for a lot of the people that I you know, have worked with, um, and especially with, you know, gay people that started at a younger age, obviously, the identifying of being gay and the trauma and the emotional pain that involves with, you know, this idea that everybody hates me or I'm scared for people to know. Did any of that happen with you when you were younger? How did, how, and I'm just curious on this with you. Um, yeah. Um, so coming out, uh, you know, I, I had a supportive family where initially they struggled with the issue, you know, because they, they very much were raised in a, you know, an environment where uh, being gay was considered a sin. And, you know, they, they were not 
uber religious, but they were religious enough. They, they adhered to, you know, like what, what they believe that the Bible taught in terms of, you know, that homosexuality was considered a sin. And, and so when I came out in college and shared that with them, and, and even my own coming out process was somewhat delayed. You know, when I was in high school, I was more focused on my academics. I really was not uh, you know, likely because of the fact that I was gay, I wasn't going out and experimenting with girls. And, um, you know, I lived in a relatively conservative uh, suburb of Los Angeles. So, you know, there wasn't, there just wasn't a lot of gay people around me. Mm -hmm. When I went to college, I went to UC Santa Cruz, which is one of the more liberal campuses. And it was there that I first um, started to at least appreciate my sexuality for what it was. Uh, it took a couple of years. I had a girlfriend for uh, the first two years of college, um, but I was very active and involved on the college campus. And through you know education and through just exposure to other people that I could relate to a lot more, I, I began to understand who I was and I began to identify more as uh, someone that was gay. Uh, initially, there was some pushback with my family, but to their credit, they, they went to uh, a counselor and they did a lot of work around just trying to be more accepting. Um, and they went from being resistant, like, we don't want to talk about this, to, you know, when I was with my partner, they eventually attended our civil union and they became very close with my partner. He would come to the, the house for the holidays. So I think because of having a... Uh, a supportive family like even in the worst moments they were still like you're still our son we still love you this is just an issue that we have some difficult you know moments around i didn't have to experience some of the struggles that some of my friends or people that i met along the way uh would encounter which was you know you, you'll get kicked out or you know you're shunned by society and so sometimes it would be easier to self-medicate um, and, and to come to the peer pressure. I mean, you know, drugs and alcohol are, are very prevalent in the gay community because it's a way for us to connect and relate to each other. It's where we met each other at the bars oftentimes. Uh, you know, it's a, a, it was a safe space. And, you know, it, there's a lot of positives around that. But, you know, some of the downsides, you know, you go to a circuit party and, you know, the people are strung out on, on drugs, you know, and, and that is part of the scene, you know. Part of why I didn't consider myself to have a drinking problem, despite the fact that I would easily you know, drink anyone under the table, was because everybody else around me in my gay community was doing the same thing I was. So I didn't see it as a problem. Right. But if you compared me to somebody out in the regular world, yeah, I probably was drinking in excess and then later in life certainly you know using the drugs in excess as well so i do think that the the drug has that stigma that for some that start earlier in life it's probably as a result of just you know the struggles with overcoming you know being comfortable in your own skin yeah and then you get into recovery and you know then it's like oh now where am i going to meet somebody because obviously you don't go to bars and you don't <laughs> you know don't go to clubs and things like that um, and that's a battle that everybody goes through, you know, with, you know, getting, I mean, cause so many people have met people, that's where they meet them, nightclubs, bars, you know, parties, and then you get clean and sober. And now where am I go, where am I supposed to go to meet people? Uh, you know, I, uh, I do a lot of service work, uh, within the recovery world and part of what was so difficult for me when I first got sober is my way of meeting people, whether it was when I was in my relationship or, or when I was later single, was as soon as I would get to the bar, I would make a beeline for that, uh, you know, to get at least a couple of cocktails in me just to be able to take the edge off so I could feel comfortable enough to be able to, you know, interact with the people around me. Uh, there's just a lot of that that's happening. And so when I'm sober, I no longer have that accessible to me. So even going to something as simple as like a, a sober birthday celebration or a fellowship after a meeting uh you know or a, a silver convention all those kind of things um i'm still sitting in the same uncomfortable skin that i was before but i don't have that go-to anymore so i made the decision to hop into service so that way i could keep my hands busy i could keep myself occupied uh and i didn't have to sit there you know like wondering whether i'm doing the right thing whether i'm looking a certain way um, you know, and I, I use that as a means of being able to build my confidence slowly and surely. 
it, it's uh, it's a work in progress, you know. Like to this point, you know, I've had sex once in sobriety, and um, I have kind of tried and failed at a couple of times at dating. Uh, because, you know, and for me, I got into my 14 year relationship when I was 22, right out of college. And that was my first real gay relationship. So I didn't really have the experience of having to date. When I, you know, last time I dated, the AOL chat rooms were popular, you know. So now having to come into this world where it's a whole different, you know, scene and, you know, youth and age are so much more appealing, at least in the gay world. You know, I'm, I'm 45, which, you know, it's not that old, but in the gay Los Angeles world, it can feel like it's ancient, you know, and, and so sometimes it's just easier to not have to go there. But I also know that it's good for me to be able to kind of push through that discomfort, too. Now, a lot of people that decide or make the decision to eventually get clean, right, have to have some real pain in life, right? Something that has to, you know, for me in 2001, you know, I was arrested four times, six months. I was looking at 15 years in prison. That was the punch in the back of the head or the, <laughs> you know, that I needed to um, really take a look at, you know, the decisions that I was making, you know, the decisions I was making and what I was eventually going to do. Um, what was it that really did that for you? What was the, what was the end thing that just sort of broke it for you? So I like to say that the sobriety I'm in now is my third sobriety. My first one started in 2017, and it was right after I lost my career job. Um, I had been there for about 13 and a half years. Uh, I was making some really poor choices as a result of my using. Um, some government auditors found me passed out on the floor, and it eventually led to an investigation, which, long story short, I got terminated. That was the first time that really I started to see that life was becoming unmanageable. Up to that point, you know, yes, friends were, be, were disappointed. Yes, my family found out, but you know, I wasn't really caring about those things. Those weren't serious consequences in the moment. Right. Losing the job, of course, that was impacting me because now I couldn't pay for the drugs that I was getting before and I, and I didn't have the same resources available to me. So even though I didn't yet have the internal desire to quit, it gave me at least the starting point to say, okay, maybe I should get clean if for no other reason. I don't have an income coming in, so I need to you know, be self-supporting. And so I went to recovery for a summer, um, but it didn't really connect. And it was really many of the events along the way post that first sobriety um, that lasted for about 67 days. Uh, and you know, it was the psychosis that I found myself in. It was getting arrested a couple of times for trespassing. Um, it was uh, having the paramedics at my house several times over for people that you know, had OD'd. And then one of those times uh, I found myself on that stretcher when I you know, ingested an ounce and a half of GHB and almost lost my life. And I had my ex come visit me at the hospital. I had my parents come visit me. And you know, seeing that, that look in their eyes of resignation thinking that they had you know lost me forever that still wasn't the moment that like convinced me i wanted to get clean but it was it was all these moments leading up to that point and i really at the turn of 2019 uh, shortly after new year's i i was just looking at what my life had become and it had grown smaller and smaller and smaller and had reached a point where i i was easily going to get to a point where I was either going to die, I was going to end up in jail, um, you know, or I was going to have some sort of destructive thing happen that would be the point of no return. And I knew that I needed to stop that. Um, I also knew that I, I had the ability to potentially help other people because that was something I always enjoyed doing in my, you know, before I got into the, the drugs. And so I think having that knowledge that I have the wherewithal to be able to do this if I can just commit myself to it. And I, I have the ability to be able to do things that will, you know, hopefully be able to help other people. It was a combination of my internal belief on wanting to like get clean and, and repair the relationships in my life. And then also being able to hopefully get clean so that I could then pass this on to somebody else. I really, I like talking to somebody that had a meth problem. Because, you know, again, that was my drug of choice, you know, and I don't know how much you were doing regularly. I mean, I was up to, you know, 
three and a half, four, five grams a day, you know, and I was an IV drug user too. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the difficulties and the challenges of getting off of it, you know, is for me was, was tremendous. The emotion, the depression, you know, that beats you down. Um, you know, you identified, you know, I mean, being caught asleep at your job, which probably was a result of you being up too long or something sure. <laughs> related about to that. four and a half days of that on that particular bout. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, we run out of epinephrine, which is our, you know, adrenaline. And so it's just the only way to replenish it is sleep. So our body shut down, <laughs> you know, yep. I wrote in my book, the story, I crashed my car three times in one night. Um, because I was trying to score dope and I was out of dope and my body wasn't staying up anymore. And, yeah. um, and that's a scary place to get to, but you know, the, when, and I know with me, you know, when I had made that decision that I wanted to get clean and sober. And again, I, I had done it many, many different times after I relapsed in 2013. And I had to make that decision once again, to go to a rehab. I went to Tarzana treatment treatment center in Los Angeles and, um, and I, I didn't want to do it. I dreaded, I knew it was coming because I knew the, cause I'd been through it, you know, again, multiple times and, you know, the sleeping for four to five days, the depression, the just crying at a Hallmark commercial, you know, the complete inability to control my feelings and my emotions. Um, and I know meth addicts understand that that the best you know, as far as the emotional instability, how was that experience for you? It, it was the best way to describe it was, um, I had what I like to call the split brain, uh, persona where there was the one side of me that had felt just utterly alone. You know, like I, I had reached points where, you know, of course, you know, once I lost the, the job and I didn't have the money, I didn't have the drugs. Uh, the people that were the so-called friends, they, you know, they went away. And, you know, it, and of course, the people that were my friends before I was a crystal meth addict, they, they gave up on me, you know, and my, my family was, you know, they started to attend Al-Anon in a smart way, um, and which I hated, of course, at the time, because Al-Anon was telling them to put up boundaries. And I'm like, no, I need you most, you know, I need you more now. Um, so that part was the struggle. And I wanted so badly... You know, I, I distinctly remember when I was in New York, um, it was the, the holiday in which I, I had tested positive for HIV and I was in this hotel room between Christmas and New Year's. I was Sarah converting and I, I had a, a fever of about 104 degrees, could barely get out of bed. And I'm looking out the window and it's like Christmas day, I can barely move and I'm just in such like despair and defeat um, because like my family feels so far away and they had just told me two weeks prior not to come home for the holidays because when I did come home for Thanksgiving, I couldn't stay in long enough. I ended up like, you know, escaping in the middle of the night the day after Thanksgiving to go party and then came back in. Uh, and they asked me not to do anything like that when I was there. So, you know, it, it was knowing all those things that were familiar to me that were just starting to like fall away and knowing that I, I, couldn't get them back in, but I wanted so badly to. So I had that side of me that desperately wanted to get clean and didn't have like the, I didn't have the desire to uh, engage in a lot of the things that I used to enjoy. Going out to the movies, you know, having friends over for dinner, you know, a lot of the things that would, you know, that kind of activate that, that pleasure uh, stimulus in my brain those are the things that used to be able to make me happy. You know, that, that dopamine rush from the drug made all those things feel like, you know, like nothing. Like I couldn't enjoy sitting through a half hour sitcom anymore. That wasn't something right. that would bring me pleasure. It had to be something extreme. Right. So, you know, there was the one side of me that was feeling depressed and, you know, feeling just utterly alone. And yet the drug continued to always pull. And I would, I would have this kind of endless cycle of, wanting to get clean and crying on the phone to my parents or crying like in some, you know, the stoop somewhere when I didn't have anywhere else to go, finally find a place where I could crash for a couple of days, getting up and making a mental, uh, you know, 
affirmation to myself that I want to get clean and then getting hit up by somebody on a text saying, hey, I have a drug, you want to come over? And almost like all that just completely went away and said, sure, I'll be there. And it's like it, it like didn't even, I, I wouldn't even second guess it. I would just immediately go. You know, so that split brain thing is what I'd, I'd like to reference back to because there is two very equally pulling things at me, but that rush of the drug it's like it, it would win out almost every time. That's uh, that's the ambivalent nature of addiction. Yeah, you know, we're constantly going through this ambivalence. It's sobriety's great, sounds good. Oh, I want to do it, and then yeah, not today. Maybe we'll do it later. You know, and even in sobriety, you know, we can still experience these things. You know, we can see, yeah, sobriety's great. I love it. I feel great. And then you're like, ah, today, fuck it. You know, I think getting loaded sounds good. Now we don't have to do it obviously, but you know, these can still happen to us. And that, and that is the, I, I think the real, you know, I think everybody still goes through that, that ambivalence a little bit, you know? Um, yeah, good. No, maybe. Uh, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The ambivalence and you know, that, that euphoric recall, um, and uh, as a fellow, you know, recovering meth addict, you know, in, in that first 12 to 18 months, there are times where you can just be going about your day and a thought about using could come in and it would just be this flood of a rush that in, you know, for even for a temporary basis is such a strong pull. Yeah. Um, and it does fortunately dissipate over time, but there is this long roller coaster of swings that you essentially go through. Um, you know, in, in early recovery that you have to really be committed to it because uh, with us using the drug as a solution time and again, you know, when we're out there using, uh, it, it very much becomes our go-to. But, you know, Absolutely. if we can apply the tools, that's really where it, it saved me and where I was able to build that foundation. Yep. It's definitely, it's definitely got that pull. I mean, you can get it, you can get the memory so strong you can taste it yep i i've woken up from dreams where uh you know like i i was like using via you know iv in the dream and i would wake up feeling just as high as i did back when i actually used i mean it, it was it was crazy how how strong that was and the brain you know the chemical in the brain it can't tell the difference so you know it yeah. it thinks that you're just as high as if you were actually using the drug yeah which is which is goes back to this high wall clean if you don't have the drug in you and you're feeling high then it's not the drug that's getting you high obviously it's coming from within you right <laughs> so that proves Absolutely. it yeah <laughs> there you go i gave you the proof that you yeah. needed <laughs> no you know it's it's funny that in 2013 when i'd relapsed that's what um that's what pushed me in that direction i had you know i had 11 years clean and sober worked in the industry i was doing you know working in the court system with alternative sentencing i i mean it was i was doing so many things in recovery and i had a dream and i had a dream so powerful I had 11 years clean and sober you know and i had a dream so powerful that i woke up when i woke up i could literally i could taste it i could feel it my brain was just thinking dude you got to do it you know mm -hmm. everything um, now I did make kind of a dumb decision because I actually did have a pipe full of meth that was in my desk, but it was not mine. It was actually, I found it. Um, we had rented a room to this guy. Actually, it was a gay couple. We rented a room and um, I told him because we knew he had had a prior meth problem. I told him, like, if you, if you, uh, if we rent this room and I think you're high, I'm coming in here, I'm going to find your shit and I'm throwing you the fuck out you know and so after a period of time i started seeing all the signs in the world i went in there i found four glass pipes i smashed three of them kept one because when i saw them next, when i saw them next i was gonna be like okay here you go get the fuck out right and yeah. uh and i didn't see him for days it sat in the drawer and i had a dream i mean it was it was it was it was almost like it was a, a destined to be <laughs> it, it almost makes you wonder if when you were exposed to the pipe and knowing that it was in that that drawer almost like subconsciously it like planted the seed in your mind because i know once you wake up from that dream like to me it's like you've gotten on board that train and you have a very finite period to 
you know, talk it out, get on the phone with your sponsor, do what you need to do uh, to be able to like bring down that very strong trigger. Because otherwise, if you if you hold on to that, it just becomes something that very quickly germinates. And before you know it, that train has left the station and you're in prelapse mode. Well, I'll tell you what's funny was I had, I, I call them the, the Beals above and benefactor, right? The, the, you know, the two voices, Beals above the evil benefactor, the kindly helper. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think back on that day and I, I had that battle. I literally spent probably 30 minutes battling with myself because, I mean, I had all this experience over the years. I knew, I know, I mean, I've, you know, in, in, in the recovery world as a counselor, I was program director, executive director, I owned a program clinic. I mean, you know, I had all this experience and, and I remember Morella actually went to work and, um, and I grabbed it out of there and I literally was kind of pacing back and forth. I'm thinking, you know what? Take a hit. You can do it. You can do just one. And I'm thinking like, dude, that's fucking crazy. There's no way you could do just one. Yeah, you can do you, you know, come on, you just a little bit, not a big deal. You know, I'm going like, no, 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 man. You've proved yourself that wrong many, many times over the years, you know? Yeah. But you know, you know, <laughs> just go back and forth and back and forth until I did to finally take the hit. And it was crazy because I took the hit and I instantly, my brain went, you're fucked. Yep. Yep. I knew it. Yeah. I mean, instantaneously, I was like, you know, it's over. I, I feel like clean time is the greatest tool, but it also is almost like it, it, it can harm you in some ways when you reach that point of actually picking up the drug, because the, the more clean time you have and that you accrue, you're, you're not wanting to lose that, you know, like I, I you you got 11 years sober and you were you know really not wanting to have to start back at day one again but once you actually pick it up you know the realization that you no longer have 11 years you know then the buckets can very much come into play well yeah yes and the problem and i've told clients this all the time i mean the the greatest problem a lot of people have and you know and you'll hear this sometimes too you know it's like the person that's got 30 years clean and sober is closer to a relapse than the person that's got one day right, right. which makes sense because memory you know our minds have a tendency of forgetting painful things in life so we don't you know so we it's almost easier to rationalize it at 11 years you know, I mean, come on, I'm 11 years, I'm older, I'm smarter. I got, you know, <laughs> this, you know, this, this mindset, I lost my passion. That's what I kind of always say about it. Like I had at that point in time, I had lost my passion. I'd lost my business. I was working for, you know, you know, shitload less money than I was when I owned the program, struggling financially. That's why we ended up having to rent a room to, you know, some, this, this couple. Um, and so I had sort of lost my passion for things. Mm -hmm. And that also made it easier for me to make that decision. You know, and then of course you fall into the, well, you know, maybe I could just sell dope and then make money. <laughs> <laughs> Had you stepped back at that point from your recovery, you know, knowing that you were 11 years clean, was there, was there a bit of like complacency and saying, okay, I, I have this under control. I could, it's, it's in a place that, where I can manage it. So I don't need to maybe participate as much in the recovery. And the reason why I ask that is because I know for me, there are, you know, some of the memories have faded. Obviously I'm at two and a half years clean. So I'm nowhere near the 11, but I do know that some of those memories that were so strong early on have faded somewhat. 100%. And yeah. And, and the, what, does help is when I go to, for example, like a, a meeting where there's a lot of beginners, uh, you know, newcomers that are there because they will share experiences. You know, of course, you know, a lot of them are kind of walking through that door, you know, or dragging themselves through that door in just a state of misery because they're, they're coming from the consequences and their stories will be ones that will bring back those memories to me of, oh yeah, I remember what it was like there. And so it kind of like brings me right. back to that place again. Um, but I'm just curious from your standpoint, you know, at 11 years, was any of that complacency there in your life? Uh, yes, absolutely. The, the biggest things that I didn't do was I didn't talk. I wasn't talking about my feelings with people. You know, I wasn't talking about, you know, like I had these financial struggles. I was worried all the time. I was, you know, in this areas and I never talked to anybody about it. And I just held, held all that stuff in. On the flip side to that, I'm actually glad it happened. I know that's crazy to say, but I can actually, you know, today 
and the, the and this took me a while to get to trust me <laughs> but you know i i eventually got to this place to where you know i realized that you know everybody's like you lost everything you know oh my god you know and then i came to this realization i didn't lose shit everything i knew all my experience all my knowledge i still have all that stuff right and I learned that now I'm going to reframe this past. I can take this experience. I can make it positive. I can learn from it. Um, and it was also an entire chapter in my book. <laughs> it, it wrote itself in some ways. Right? Easily. <laughs> well, I, I do like to say kind of the same thing, um, you know, where I, uh, I, I'm grateful for what I had to go through. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, in the moment of it, it, it was Maybe. misery. I mean, it was what some of the hardest moments of my life. But you know, I was, I was someone that I, I think you know was altruistic uh, prior to my addiction. But it was a lot about how the world revolved around me. Mm. And you know, what I will say is, going through the experiences I did, I got opportunities to engage with people that I may not have normally met otherwise, you know, people that had experienced living on the streets for a considerable amount of time, you know, or people that have lived without means, didn't have a support structure, had experienced um, some very difficult traumas in their childhood. And I got to learn and hear about so many different stories um, and, you know, it humbled me in a lot of ways. And, you know, I, I went from, you know, having a very successful career where I had all the things. I had the, the materialistic things that, you know, so many of us strive for growing up. Um, I had those, but it, it wasn't necessarily making me happy. And, and, you know, today, you know, I had to be stripped of everything and, you know, start to rebuild my life. Um, but the things that I appreciate today are much more, uh, you know, things about, you know, having gratitude towards, you know, the quality of the relationships that are around me and, you know, the, stopping and, and just, you know, being grateful for the little things that I took for granted before, you know, so I, I'm grateful for my addiction because it got me to shift my perspective in life and see things in a, a, a much different way. And I'm, I'm much, uh, I'd say, I'm more of service today than I ever would have been before. And um, I, I just, I view the world through a different lens. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for that, I'm very grateful. Mm -hmm. And we have, and we have that opportunity, you know, because we, you know, obviously with, with our experiences with drug addiction, our experiences with all those people, you know, like you were mentioning out there that they're not necessarily bad people. They're yeah. sick people. They're, uh, you know, they have a major problem. They look bad from the eyes. Right. But when we, you know, we always want to separate the difference between who somebody is and their behaviors, because Absolutely. you're not your behavior, you know? Right. And even the ones that were engaging in, uh, you know, theft or, you know, were scammers. I mean, you know, some folks were very creative and clever with some of the crimes that they would commit. But, you know, when I got down to the root of it and I would get to know these people beyond just the bad reputation that they had established, you know, what I found is that, you know, a lot of these people were broken and they, they had something that had happened to them that uh, caused them to just uh, make some choices that caused their life to go in a different direction. I would say probably 95% of the people that I met out there, even the ones that engage in some, uh, you know, some criminal practices, are not bad people. Right. They were good people that just uh, fell on some hard times and needed to, to make some decisions for survival or for whatever the case was. Yes, there's a handful of bad people, but you know what? So that's the case in the rest of the world as well. No, a hundred percent. And you know, you think about it with, you know, they they're doing something that seems to be the solution, right? So I do drugs, I'm in pain, I'm suffering, I'm, you know, and I do drugs and I'm like, oh, great, this is wonderful. I don't have to feel. So this has solved my problem. It doesn't really, but we think it is, right? Mm -hmm. We believe that this is solving my problem. Now, because I need this, I need to make sure that I'm able to have this. And that's where the crimes come in. Right. You know, is that people go out to make sure that they are able to afford their solution. You know, otherwise, if they run out, they're dead or they're in some deep trouble. 
Yeah. And that's the mindset. I'm obviously we know that's not true, but, but that's the true belief. It is the solution that becomes, you, you really do end up having tunnel vision. I mean, as, as big as my life was prior to my addiction, I reached that same point. I, I had reached a point in my life where I really thought my options were extremely limited and I thought I'm going to die this way. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, everything else had fallen away and I had moments where I could not think that I would get back into having a place in society again. Like I would walk for you know hours on end, you know, being high, coming down, leaving some person's place and, you know, not having access to a phone or transportation. And I would walk by these coffee shops that I used to go to with colleagues when I was in my career. Mm. And I would be standing on the outside looking very much like someone that was a, you know, a transient, uh, even though I did have my own place, but that's how I was living. And you know, clearly no one was gonna let me into their establishment. You know, and it's not like I had the means anyway. I mean, at that time, I was living on food stamps and general relief, and I can tell you all my excess funds, you know, outside of some sugar and a few, you know, pieces of junk food, everything else was going towards drugs, you know, and, you know, that was my existence. And I didn't think that I had other choices. And, you know, I can look back now and think that's crazy because I had unlimited choices prior to my addiction and I knew that I did. And if I really thought logically, in other words, if I wasn't high and could think in a rational state of, of you know, my mind, I, I did have options, but I, I had gotten to a point where the drug had essentially convinced me that that was my only, my only means of survival. What is your book about? So the first third of the book is really just kind of walking through um, you know, my life, kind of talking about my upbringing, uh, sharing about my experience in my relationship, and um, touching a bit on the the end of my relationship, how I got to the point of having this this trauma that kind of took me in a different direction, and leading up to my addiction, and touching on some of my experiences while I was out using, and it brought me, it brings you right up to the point where uh, I got sober in this particular sobriety. So um, it walked through a couple of my relapses. Um, and then at the end of that first section, I say it's time to get sober. And then the rest of the book is really devoted to uh, my live in the moment journaling experience um, in my 90, 90, of early, 90 meetings and 90 days of early recovery. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, that was very healing for me when I did it at the time. Um, it was, the journaling was done in a very public way way um, because I was in a dire straits when I first got sober. I didn't, you know, I didn't have access to any of the social support services that I had before. I needed to be able to find funds to be able to you know, pay my rent. Mm -hmm. And so I had posted a uh, kind of like a GoFundMe, but through Facebook um, in order to try and, you know, raise funds for my living expenses in early sobriety. And the people that were on my Facebook uh, you know, group of friends that was like family and, and former acquaintances, um, you know, their, their response was, congrats for getting sober, um, but you're a drug addict for not giving you money, you know? And so I, I decided to do this journaling really as a way to kind of prove to the people in my life that I meant it this time and that I was serious about my sobriety. And so Has it worked? It worked. I mean, I'm still sober today. <laughs> but what, what was nice was that uh, with each of the meetings that I, I it started out with, uh, you know, blogging about the meetings, but then it became kind of almost like this like diary of sorts where I talked about some of my experiences of losing my apartment and having to, you know, ask for couch commitments or jobs up at the podium when I would be at a meeting or doing what I could just to kind of like get by in early sobriety. And, you know, sometimes a, a speaker, something that someone would touch on, um, it would remind me of an experience from my using or from earlier in my life. And I would reflect on that in the journaling. Mm -hmm. And because this was all done on social media, I would have people that would be commenting saying, um, you know, your story really touched me. Um, I, 
I'm reaching out to get sober because of what I've read or, you know, like I was molested as a child and I'm feeling empowered to be able to contact somebody and, you know, disclose this. Like, you know, very personal and vulnerable things that people were sharing. And a lot of people were just talking about how they were inspired by mm -hmm. someone being vulnerable with their own story. And along the way, um, I actually had continued the blog beyond the 1990. I, I did it um, not as consistently, but um, pretty much on a weekly basis throughout my first year of sobriety. Um, and over the course of that time, somebody had suggested that they thought it would be a, a great way to uh, you know, put something like that together, that it could potentially help other people in recovery, uh, and also maybe give a little bit of a, a, an eye for those that did not have direct experience with drug addiction, but maybe could learn a little bit uh, and be exposed to the fact that, you know, not every person that is actively using uh, is that stereotypical junkie that's walking by on the street that's crazy and talking to himself. Or maybe they are, right. but they have a story that um, is there and they weren't always that person. And by the way, that person could be your nephew or your neighbor or your son. And so, you know, be more gentle with them. Uh, where, so let everybody know where they could get your book. Uh, they can get it on Amazon, um, and it is available on paperback as well as ebook uh, through Kindle. And I'm actually working on an audio version of it as we speak. Is there anything that uh, you want to mention that I haven't asked you? I really appreciate the opportunity. You know, from one crystal meth addict to another. Uh, you know, I I experience and what I enjoy most is getting to know people's stories, getting to know who they are. Uh, especially for those of us that are, you know, in an active addiction or recovering addicts, you know, that how we got to where, you know, that point is and just being able to connect in a lot of ways. So, you know, I'm really grateful that you have this podcast to be able to share these stories with other people, because I really do think it's, it's helping the world and uh, it's exposing others to hopefully something that can bring healing and relief to those that are still struggling. So yeah. I thank you. Such a powerful drug. And, um, you know, not, and, and I know, you know, you, I know you had mentioned, you kind of knew a little bit about like, you, you know, how bad it was when you did it and stuff like that. But I guarantee you didn't view it in a fashion that it was going to destroy your life completely. If I did a little bit of meth, you know, but the grip that it has, I mean, it, it to me is, you know, that's why we always called it shit. You know, you can call it the devil, the demon, you can, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, the <laughs> tempter, because, you know, when you first do it, it's not bad. There doesn't seem to be anything bad with it at all. You know, um, it, it's all the positive. I mean, you, you gain confidence. Yep. You, you know, it, if you enjoy sex on it, it like amplifies your right. sex life. Um, it, it suppresses all those painful emotions that you have. Yep. Um, it also, you know, like for those of us in the gay world, like it helps with your uh, physical, I mean, you can eat whatever you want and still like, you know, maintain a, a decent figure. Granted, you get skin and bones down the road, but early on, it really does, you know, help. You don't have to really do a lot to be able to like have a great body. And yep. so it's like all these pluses. Yep. And it, just as you said, that there's no, like, like, why wouldn't I have done this a long time ago? And you know, what's the harm in this? Why isn't and, everybody doing it? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. I had those thoughts many a times. <laughs> we had to kind of go way down so far um, to where eventually our body needed it. Yep. Otherwise it wasn't going to function. And that's what we don't think about, you know? And then of course, all those positives that we did it for stopped working, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when, what we can do is we can find ways of getting those without drugs. We can find ways to get high without drugs, high while clean. Right. <laughs> and, uh, I want to, um, ask you, and I ask everybody this at the end of the show, um, if you wanted to send a message out to anybody that's suffering and in pain, what would you tell them? That you don't have to be alone, that there is absolutely hope and that no matter how difficult it gets, there, there is a solution beyond just the drugs and, um, you know, to not be afraid to reach out for help. And that is what was probably one of the hardest things for me to do. And probably what took me so long to finally get clean is I, I just was stubborn and I refused to ask those that cared for so long uh, to ask for help, you know? And so I suffered much longer than I needed to. So, you know, 
be willing to just you know, give it a try without it because life is definitely much better on the other side. Well, hey, I want to thank you for getting high with me today. I really awesome. appreciate it's been it. Been a nice high experience. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> Hey, I want to thank everybody for tuning into another episode of High Wall Clean. Keep getting high. Well, let's do it clean. I'll see you soon. Thanks.